Hi students, welcome to lesson number 29, social stratification, concept and overview of theories, part B. Differentiation is the law of nature, true, it is in the case of human society. Human society is not homogeneous, but heterogeneous. No two individuals are exactly alike. Diversity and inequality are inherent in society. Hence, human society is everywhere stratified. All societies arrange their members in terms of superiority, inferiority and equality. The vertical scale of evaluation, placing of people in strata or layers is called stratification. Those in the top stratum have more power, privileges and prestige than those below. Now let us discuss about objectives. The main objectives of this lesson are social stratification, a Marxist perspective the social stratification, a Weberian perspective. Now let us discuss about social stratification, a Marxist perspective. Marxist perspective provides a radical alternate to functionalist view of the nature of social stratification. They regard stratification as a device rather than an integrative structure. They see it as a mechanism whereby some exploit others rather than as a means of furthering collective goals. From a Marxist perspective, systems of stratification derive from the relationships of social groups to the means of production. Marx used the term class to refer to the main strata in all stratification systems. From a Marxist viewpoint, a class is a social group whose members share the same relationship to the means of production. Marx believed that Western society had developed through four main epochs. Number one, primitive communism. Number two, ancient society, number three, feudal society, number four, capitalist society. Primitive communism is represented by the societies of prehistory and provides the only example of a classless society. From then on, all societies are divided into two major classes, namely masters and slaves in ancient society, landlords and serfs in feudal society and capitalists and wage laborers in capitalist society. During each historical epoch, the labor power required for production was supplied by the subject class that is by slaves, serfs and wage laborers respectively. The subject class is made up of the majority of the population, whereas the ruling or dominant class forms a minority. Classes did not exist during the era of primitive communism, when societies were based on a socialist mode of production. Classes emerge when the productive capacity of society expands beyond the level required for subsistence. This occurs when agriculture becomes the dominant mode of production. Private property and the accumulation of surplus wealth form the basis for the development of class societies. In particular, they provide the preconditions for the emergence of a class of producers and a class of non-producers. Some people are able to acquire the means of production 
and others are therefore obliged or work for them. The result is a class of non-producers which owns the means of production and a class of producers which owns only its labor power. From a Marxist perspective, the relationship between the major social classes is one of mutual dependence and conflict. Thus, in capitalist society, the bourgeoisie and proletariat are dependent upon each other. Wage laborers must sell their labor power in order to survive as they do not own a part of the means of production and lack the means to produce goods independently. They are therefore dependent for their livelihood on the capitalists and the wages they offer. The capitalists as non-producers are dependent on the labor power of wage laborers since without it there would be no production. However, the mutual dependency of the two classes is not a relationship of equal or symmetrical reciprocity. Instead, it is a relationship of exploiter and exploited, oppressor and oppressed. In particular, the ruling class gains at the expense of the subject class and there is therefore a conflict of interest between them. Capitalism therefore involves the investment of capital in the production of commodities with the aim of maximizing profit in order to accumulate more capital. Money is converted into commodities by financing production. Those commodities are then sold and converted back into money at such a price that the capitalists end up with more money than they started with. Capital is privately owned by a minority, the capitalist class. In Marx's view, however, this capital is gained from the exploitation of the mass of the population that is the working class. Marx argued that capital as such produces nothing, only labor produces wealth. Yet the wages paid to the workers for their labor are well below the value of the goods they produce. The difference between the value of wages and commodities is known as surplus value. This surplus value is appropriated in the form of profit by the capitalists because they are non-producers. The bourgeoisie are therefore exploiting the proletariat, the real producers of wealth. Marx maintained that in all class societies, the ruling class exploits and oppresses the subject class. Then power and the superstructure. Political power in Marxist theory comes from economic power. The power of the ruling class therefore stems from its ownership and control of the means of production. As the superstructure of society which uh, constitute of the major institutions, values and belief systems is seen to be largely shaped by the economic infrastructure, which is the relations of production will be reproduced in the superstructure. Therefore, the dominance of the ruling class in the relations of production will be reflected in the superstructure. In particular, the political and legal systems will reflect ruling class interests since in Marx's words, the existing relations of production between individuals must necessarily express themselves also as political and legal relations. Ruling class ideology produces 
false consciousness, a false picture of the nature of the relationship between social classes. Members of both classes tend to accept the status quo as normal and natural and are largely unaware of the true nature of exploitation and oppression. In this way, the conflict of interest between the classes is disguised and a degree of social stability produced. But the basic contradictions and conflicts of class societies remain unresolved. Marx believed that the class struggle was the driving force of social change. He stated that the history of all societies up to the present is the history of the class struggle. A new historical epoch is created by the development of superior forces of production by a new social group. These developments take place within the framework of the previous era. The merchants and industrialists who spearheaded the rise of capitalism emerged during the feudal era. They accumulated capital, laid the foundations for industrial manufacture, factory production and the system of wage labor, all of which were essential components of capitalism. The class struggles of history have been between minorities. Capitalism, for instance, developed from the struggle between the feudal aristocracy and the emerging capitalist class, both groups in numerical terms forming a minority of the population. Major changes in history have involved the replacement of one form of private property by another and of one type of production technique by another. Capitalism involved the replacement of privately owned land and an agricultural economy by privately owned capital and an industrial economy. Marx believed that the basic contradictions contained in a capitalist economic system would lead to its eventual destruction. The proletariat would overthrow the bourgeoisie and seize the means of production, the source of power. Property would be communally owned and since all members of society would now share the same relationship to the means of production, a classless society would result. Since history is the history of the class struggle, history would now end. The communist society which would replace capitalism would contain no contradictions, no conflicts of interest and would therefore be unchanging. Now let us discuss about the social stratification, a Weberian perspective. Weber believed that social stratification results from a struggle for scarce resources in society. Although he saw this struggle as being primarily concerned with economic resources, also involved struggles of prestige and for political power. Like Marx, Weber saw class in economic terms. He argued that classes develop in market economies in which individuals compete for economic gain. He defined a class as a group of individuals who share a similar position in a market economy and by virtue of that fact receive similar economic rewards. Thus, in Weber's terminology, a person's class situation is basically their market situation. Those who share a similar class situation also share similar life chances. Their economic position will directly affect their chances of 
obtaining those things defined as desirable in their society. For example, access to higher education and good quality housing. Like Marx, Weber argued that the major class division is between those who own the forces of production and those who do not. Thus, those who have substantial property holdings will receive the highest economic rewards and enjoy superior life chances. Weber saw important differences in the market situation of the propertyless groups in society. In particular, the various skills and services offered by different occupations have differing market values. For instance, in capitalist society, managers, administrators and professionals receive relatively high salaries because of the demand for their services. Weber distinguished the following class groupings in capitalist society. Number one, the property upper class. Number two, the propertyless white collar workers. Number three, the petty bourgeoisie. Number four, the manual working class. While class forms one possible basis for group formation, collective action and the acquisition of political power, Weber argued that there are other bases for these activities. In particular, groups form because their members share a similar status situation. Whereas, class refers to the unequal distribution of economic rewards, status refers to the unequal distribution of social honor. Occupations, ethnic and religious groups and most importantly lifestyles are accorded differing degrees of prestige or esteem by members of society. A status group is made up of individuals who are awarded a similar amount of social honor and therefore share the same status situation. Cas also provide a good example of the process described by Weber as social closure. Social closure involves the exclusion of some people from membership of a status group. In the caste system, social closure is achieved through prohibitions which prevent members of caste from marrying outside their caste. The caste system is an extreme example of social closure since the exclusion of outsiders from the status group is so complete. In many societies, class and status situations are closely linked. Weber noted that property as such is not always recognized as a status qualification, but in the long run it is and with extraordinary regularity. However, those who share the same class situation will not necessarily belong to the same status group. Novak's riches that is the newly rich are sometimes excluded from the status groups of the privileged because their tastes, manners and dress are defined as vulgar. Status groups may create division within classes. Status groups can also cut across class divisions. For example, homosexuals from different class backgrounds are involved in gay rights organizations and events such as the annual gay pride celebration in Britain. Weber's observations on status groups are important because they suggest that 
in certain situation status rather than class provides the basis for the formation of social groups. In addition, the presence of different status groups within a single class and of status groups which cut across class divisions can weaken class solidarity and reduce the potential for class consciousness. Parties which uh, Weber says power. Weber defined parties as groups which are specifically concerned with influencing policies and making decisions in the interest of their membership. In Weber's words, parties are concerned with the acquisition of social power. Parties include a variety of associations from the mass political parties of western democracies to the whole range of pressure or interest groups. In Weber's words, parties may represent interests determined through class situation or status situation. In most cases, they are partly class parties and partly status parties, but sometimes they are neither. Weber's view of parties suggests that the relationship between political groups and class and status groups is far from clear cut. Just as status groups can both divide classes and cut across class boundaries, so parties can divide and cut across both classes and status groups. Weber's analysis of classes, status groups and parties suggests that no single theory can pinpoint and explain their relationship. The interplay of class, status and party in the formation of social groups is complex and variable and must be examined in particular societies during particular time periods. Sociologists have analyzed the social stratification in different societies from different perspectives. The important sociological theories related to social stratification are Talcott Parsons, functionalist theory of stratification, Karl Marx, conflict theory of stratification, Weber's theory of stratification. All these theories have emphatically stated that almost all the societies in the world are stratified and people have unequal access to wealth, power and prestige.